Hello class and welcome to week seven. This week we get to talk about innovation and change as it relates to management. So our focus for this week, well before we get started, just remember a couple of things. You do have um, a discussion that's due this week. Also, I will be uploading your assignment um, or the project instructions that's going to be due a couple of weeks from now. So I'll be uploading that as well, so look for that. And so this week we're going to be talking about managing change and innovation. We're going to talk about um, our objectives for this week is to divine, uh, to, I'm sorry, define organizational change and explain the forces driving innovation and change in our organizations today. We're also going to identify the three innovative strategies managers implement for changing products and technologies. We're also going to talk about the value of creativity and idea incubators, that fun stuff, right? Innovation and why um, these ideas and creativity is great for creating innovative innovation and um, change within our organizations in order for our organizations to be successful. We're also going to discuss why changes in people and culture are critical to success um, and defining organizational development and large group intervention. So we have a lot of stuff going on this week. So this is an exciting topic. Um, a lot of people say, hey, one day I want to own my own business. I want to talk about, you know, being successful on my own. And so we're going to talk about this week where that plays into management um, and, and, and how that works. So um, as we glance through um, recent back issues of just about any business magazine, you will see them. Wired Magazines, Wired 40, list of the most innovative companies, Fast Companies, Fast 50, World's Most Innovative Companies, and Business Week's 25 Most Innovative Companies in the World. So everyone's talking about innovation and extolling the virtues of companies that do it right, right? So innovation is at the top of everyone's priority list today, but managing innovation and change has always been an important management capability. So if organizations don't successfully change and innovate, they die. They die because products get old. People or other companies copy all of these other things. So. Um, innovation is important to keep our economy growing. It's important to keep our companies going and growing and thriving and all of that great stuff. So um, consider that just 71 of the companies on Fortune Magazine's first list of America's 500 large corporations compiled in 1955 survived the next half century. So basically, um, there are a lot of companies that won't survive due to lack of innovation and lack of creativity and producing new products and, and that's really 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 important so um, let's start with our managers questions so um, first question is when a company makes a new product is the main concern after that uh, marketing that well what's the main concern after you produce a new product, what's the main concern? Um, well, the answer to that is marketing a product and marketing effectively are vital to success. You guys know that I'm a, a marketing guru. I love marketing. I believe in it. I believe it's at the foundation of, of every or anything successful, right? But it's not all that a company needs to worry about. If new and innovative products are not brought to market, the company is likely to gradually um, fair or fail over time. It's very, very important. Um, do you think the most important thing for a company to be innovative is to encourage lots of creative ideas? What are your thoughts on that? Well, the answer to that is without s stimulating new and even outlandish ideas, a company's capacity to innovate will greatly be reduced. So those ideas are important no matter how silly they are, you know, test them and try them. Um, perhaps equally important though is organizing to sustain innovation. Um, without such a structure, most of the creative ideas will not come to fruition. Um, so that's really, really important. So let's get started. 
So innovation and change in a work really, in the workplace. So first, let's just define organizational change. Organizational change is defined um, as the adoption of a new idea or behavior by an organization. So in today's topsy-turvy world, managing change and innovation is taking center stage. So some observers of, of business trends suggest that the knowledge economy of the late 1900s and early 2000s is rapidly being transformed into creativity, uh, into the creativity economy. So successful change actually requires that organizations be capable of both creating and implementing ideas, which means the organization must learn to be ambidextrous. Um, and so that approach, you know, basically being able to use the right and the left and all that great stuff, as it, that's, you know, how we use the term. The ambidextrous approach means incorporating um, structures and processes that are um, appropriate for both the creative impulse and for systematic implementation of, of innovations. So it's important to introduce new products and technologies because introducing new products and technologies is a vital area for innovation. A product change is a change in the organization's product or service outputs. So product and service innovation is the primary way in which organizations adapt to change in markets, technology, and competition. In fact, the iPhone 3G is an example of a new product and online filing of tax returns by the IRS is an example of service innovation that um, happened a long time ago, naturally. So a technology change is a change in the organization's production process, um, basically how the organization does its work. So technology changes are designed to make the production of a product or service more efficient. The adoption of automatic mail sorting machines by the U.S. Postal Service is an example of a technology change. So with that, there are three innovative strategies for new products and technologies. The first one is exploration. Exploration involves designing the organization to encourage creativity and the initiation of new ideas. So it is the stage where ideas of new products and technologies are born. Also, managers design the organization for exploration by establishing conditions that encourage creativity and allow new ideas to spring forth. So the second um, strategy is um, cooperation, or I'm sorry, under exploration, creativity. Um, creativity um, is the generation of novel ideas that might meet perceived needs or respond to opportunities for the organization. So creativity, our uh, creative people are known for originality and curiosity and open-mindedness, and they focus their approaches on problem solving. Um, they are usually persistent, um, they have a relaxed and playful attitude, and they're really, really receptive to new ideas. Man so where managers fit in is that managers are responsible for creating a work environment that allows creativity to flourish and creative organizations um, have typically an internal culture of playfulness, freedom, and challenge, and, gra and a grassroots participation. So the most creative companies really embrace risk and encourage their employees to experiment and make mistakes. Also under our first strategy of exploration are idea incubators. An idea incubator provides a safe harbor where ideas from employees throughout the company can be developed without interference from company bureaucracy or politics. So it's hey, a place where, you know, it's a safe haven for um, just talking and discussing our ideas. And so I know Merchandise Mart, they have um, an incubator, uh, which is pretty cool for entrepreneurship. I've uh, but talk to people here about maybe taking a field trip down there for our entrepreneurship um, students. So it's pretty, pretty awesome. So let's talk about cooperation, which is the second strategy. So internal cooperation uh, means that really companies that successfully innovate usually have um, internal um, cooperation um, and internal coordination. 
So um, they usually have the following characteristics. Number one, people in marketing have a good understanding of customer needs. And the technical specialists are aware of recent technological developments under internal coordination. And um, they make effective use of the new technology. And also, members from key departments um, under internal coordination, um, coordination um, um, often consist of research, manufacturing, marketing, um, and they all cooperate in development of the new product or service. So in the horizontal linkage model, people from several departments meet frequently in teams and task forces to share ideas and to solve problems. This model um, is increasingly important in today's high-pressure business environment because um, High, today's environment requires the developing and commercializing products and services really, really fast. And so, um, you know, under under this sort of structure, you know, typically there are these fast cycle teams, right? So a fast cycle team is a multifunctional and sometimes multinational team that works under stringent timelines and is provided with high levels of resources and empowerment in order to accomplish an accelerated product um, development project. Um, also under the model of co cooperation is external coordination. So in external coordination, organizations also look outside of their boundaries um, to find and develop new ideas. And some organizations build formal strategic partnerships such as alliances and joint ventures to improve their innovation, pro uh, their innovation success. Another characteristic is that outsourcing of partnerships can help companies get done very quickly. Um, and today's most successful companies are including customers, um, strategic partners, suppliers, and other outs outsiders directly in the product and service development process. Also, under um, this strategy of cooperation, um, open innovation has to occur. And what that means is um, that we extend the search for and commercializing of new ideas beyond the boundaries of the organization, thus external, and even beyond the boundaries of the industries. So smart companies find and use ideas really from anywhere within and outside of the organization. Finally, our um, last innovative or critical innovative strategy is entrepreneurship. Um, within entrepreneurship, we have um, different roles, right? So um, under entrepreneurship, you know, people create mechanisms to make sure new ideas are carried forward, accepted, and implemented. Um, that's very, very important. And, I, and they typically use idea champions sometimes, which is a person who sees the need for and champions productive change within the organization. Um, under that model, personal energy and effort really are required to successfully promote a new idea. Um, and champions are typically really passionately committed to the new product um, or idea despite the rejection by, by others. Champion idea successfully often requires different roles within organizations. Um, you know, the first one, um, sometimes being an inventor. So sometimes a single person may play two or more of these roles, really, but successful innovation in most companies involves an interplay of different people, um, each adopting one role. So the inventor comes up um, with a new idea and understands its technical value. Um, the champion, um, which is a different role, believes in the idea, confronts the organizational realities of cost and benefits, and gains the political and financial support needed to bring it to reality. Then there's a sponsor, typically. And this person is a high-level manager who approves and protects the idea and removes organizational barriers um, to its acceptance. And finally, there is a, a, the critic who plays the role of counterbalancing the zeal of the champion by challenging the concept, thereby preventing people in the other roles from adopting a bad idea. Another way um, to facilitate entrepreneurship is through a new venture team. 
uh, new venture team is, um, is a unit um, actually separate from the rest of the organization um, that's responsible for developing and initiating a major innovation. One variation of a new venture team um, is, a, is called a skunk work. A skunk work um, is, a, a, is a separate, small, informal, highly autonomous, and often secretive group that focuses on breakthrough ideas um, for the business. So the original Skunk Works, which still exists, uh, really was created by Lockheed Martin. I don't know if you guys are familiar with, with that company, more than 50 years ago. So the essence of a Skunk Work um, is that highly talented people are given the time and freedom to let the creativity reign, um, basically. Um, and a related idea um, is um, the new venture fund, which really provides the resources which um, individuals and groups can really draw um, from or to develop new ideas, products, um, and businesses. All successful changes involve changes in people and culture as well. Um, changes in people and culture really pertains to how employees think. Um, people change pertains to just a few employees, such as sending a handful of managers to a training course to improve their management skills. Culture change um, is a little different because it pertains to the organization as a whole, such as shifting the basic mindset from an organizational focus on rules and politics to an organizational focus on doing whatever is necessary to satisfy customers. So let's talk a little bit about training and development, and then we'll get into organization development. Training actually is one of the most frequently used approaches to changing people's mindsets. Um, so, you know, a company may offer training programs on um, teamwork, diversity, um, emotional intelligence, quality, um, communication skills, and participation, and things like that. Um, leading companies actually want to provide training and development opportunities for everyone, but really emphasize training managers in the hopes that the manager's behaviors and attitudes will influence the people underneath them or throughout the organization and lead to that culture change. Um, organization development, on the other hand, is a planned systematic process of change that uses behavioral science knowledge and techniques to improve an organization or, or I'm sorry an organization's health and effectiveness I mean, they do that um, through its ability really to adapt to the environment and improve their internal relationships while increasing learning and problem solving capabilities so organizational development actually um, addresses really three types of current problems. Um, the first one being, let me go back, sorry. The first one being um, mergers and acquisitions. Oops, I'm drawing wrong. I'm not an artist. <laughs> mergers and acquisitions. Um, the disappointing financial results of many mergers and acquisitions really are caused by the failure of the executives to determine whether the administrative style and corporate culture um, of the two companies fit. So a lot of times companies merge and then you see them go under or they get bought out and that's the reason why. Um, organizational development can really help to smooth the integration of the two firms. Uh, organizational development also helps with organizational decline. Let me see if I can get this right. And revitalization. There we go. <laughs> uh, organizations undergoing a period of decline and revitalization, really, they experience a variety of problems, such as low level of trust, lack of innovation, high turnover, um, high levels of conflict and stress. Um, and so organizational development techniques can help. Um, and greatly um, contribute greatly to the cultural revitalization. And also it addresses conflict management. Um, conflict can occur at any time and place within a healthy organization. So organizational development efforts can help to resolve conflict problems as well. So it's good. Organizational development is really, really good. Um, it's something that I'm studying currently um, because 
I see the need for it and all organizations go through change and so these these tools including training and development can really help um, with keeping um, teams and companies successful so let's talk a little more in depth about these activities um, or organizational development activities. One is team building activities. Um, they enhance the cohesiveness and success of organizational groups and teams. Another one um, is survey feedback activities, um, which begin with an employee questionnaire asking about items such as value and the climate and participation, leadership and group ho cohesion. Um, also, typically an OD or organizational development consultant provides feedback to the employees regarding their responses and problems identified from the survey or questionnaire. Most, a lot of companies do this, including us actually. Uh, and the other one is, the last one is a large group, well, the other one is large group intervention, which actually brings together participants uh, from all parts of the organization to discuss problems or opportunities um, and to plan for change. So organization uh, um, development experts really acknowledge that changes in corporate culture and human behavior are tough to accomplish and really require major effort. So the theory underlying organizational development proposes three distinct stages for achieving behavioral and um, attitudinal change. One being unfreezing, um, the second one being um, changing, and the third one being refreezing. So with unfreezing, participants must be made aware of problems and be willing to change, actually. An outside expert called a, a change agent or an OD specialist performs a systematic diagnosis of the organization um, to really identify work-related problems. Um, changing occurs when the individuals experiment with new behavior and learn new skills to be used in the workplace. Um, and so this process really is um, sometimes known as intervention, during uh, which the change agent really implements a specific plan for training managers and employees. And finally, refreezing. And this occurs when individuals uh, acquire new attitudes or values and are rewarded for them by the organization. Um, the impact of new behaviors is evaluated and then reinforced, and the change agent supplies new data that show positive changes in performance. So changes are institutionalized um, in the organizational culture so that employees can begin to view the changes as normal um, and integral part um, of, the, of the organization. So those are some of the approaches um, to um, cultural change via organizational development. Um, within companies. So we talked a lot about um, change and how to change culture, tactics um, for change and so really I want to end our discussion this week um, um, with, with innovation and change um, with how to implement um, this process and we're going to talk about the, we're going to end today discussing the process of implementation. Um, and so a new creative idea really wouldn't benefit an organization until it's in place and fully used. So executives at companies, they know um, that investing heavily in change and innovative projects are really, really important. But many of them say that they aren't very, really, they aren't very happy with their results. One frustration for managers is that employees often seem really to resist change for no apparent reason. This happens everywhere. You know, we don't like change. We get in our groove. We get used to things, and change is like, huh? It's like foreign, and it's like, why? Why do we have to? You know, what's not broke? Why are we trying to fix it? So we have these attitudes. So to effectively uh, manage the implementation process, managers need to be aware of the reasons why people resist change and use techniques to um, enlist um, employee cooperation um, and try to get cooperation. So, um, you know, some of the resist the some of the reasons why people resist change um, number one are self interest employees typically resist change they believe will take away something of value from them um, this is everywhere really you know um, a proposed change in a job design or structure or something like that may lead to perceived loss of power or prestige pay or company 
benefit so what we don't know we're typically afraid of so the fear of personal loss is perhaps the biggest obstacle to organizational change um, the second one is lack of understanding and trust employees do not understand the intended purpose of the change and so they distrust the management's um, intentions for change also uncertainty we, we again we don't know something so we get we fear it so uncertainty um, is a lack of information for future events so uncertainty represents a fear of the unknown um, as employees do not know how a change will affect them uncertainty is especially threatening really for employees who have a low tolerance for change and fear um, the unusual lastly um, different assessments and goals um, employees who will be affected by innovation may assess the proposed change differently than an idea champion or a new venture team. So critics voice legitimate disagreements over the proposed benefits of change. Um, different departments pursue different goals and innovation um, actually may distract or detract from performance and goal achievement. So um, there it is. So, you know, change is good. Innovation is good. Managing change sometimes um, can be really, really difficult. And so this week in, um, in class, we're going to discuss a few cases. Uh, we're going to have a great discussion um, about um, managing change. And we're going to have a great discussion about innovation. And we might even um, put that to the test and, and have a few activities surrounding you creating nice, innovative ideas. Um, Many of us are very, very creative, and we don't know how far things can go. So um, enjoy your week. I look forward to seeing you in class.